All right, let's bow in prayer before we begin. Our Father, your mercies are new to us each and every morning. Your faithfulness is so great, and your goodness to us is undeserved, and we are aware each and every moment of your great mercy and your great faithfulness, and we thank you for that. We thank you that we can rest in your goodness, and we pray that you may lavish your goodness upon us today through Virgil and Daryl and all that they bring to us. Help them, we pray, to equip us and inform us and encourage us and and make our hearts and our spines solid in you so that we may be men and women of courage and boldness in this culture, and that you would use our time here to great benefit and blessing upon your people, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, uh, lunch is provided today, and again, I just remind you, there's some 3 by 5 index cards on the table, or at least available out at one of the tables if you want to write down questions for the Q&A session, which is later. Um, And then uh, instead of tying this up at the end, I just wanted to make you aware, you've already seen it, that our registration for next year's conference, 2023, is costing in. We're going to be talking about being inside the prosperity gospel movement, rescuing loved ones from the prosperity gospel movement, Um, kind of an overview of the prosperity gospel, and um, Costi had, as Benny Hinn's nephew, he had an inside look at that before the Lord saved him. So he's going to be here next year for probably just a Friday night and all day Saturday and Sunday morning conference like we've done in the past. All right, um, our next session here, and by the way, it looks like uh, somebody was clubbing last night. There's glitter, there's glitter all over the stage up here. All right, our next session is the Marxist, es- Marxist Exegetology of CRT Part 1. Please welcome Daryl Harrison. Yeah, man, if this glitter wasn't here, somebody might think this was a dance floor, not a, <laughs> not a pulpit. Good morning. morning. You guys good? You ready to go? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm a natural morning person, so I don't need caffeine in the morning. I wake up ready to go, so, uh, you know, so thanks for being back. We appreciate you guys hanging in there with us. I know I speak for Virgil uh, when I say we know we hit you guys with some really deep stuff. Uh, yesterday, so um, whether you're ready or not, you're about to get more of it. Uh, so um, I'm here this morning to talk to you on part one, so this is part one of a two-part message that I'm going to be doing today on the Marxist eschatology of critical race theory. Um, so if you're taking notes, uh, if you're eating your breakfast, feel free to go ahead and, and, and do that, but I would encourage you to take notes as well as you're able to, okay? So if you're all set, we'll go ahead and get started. The Marxist Eschatology of Critical Race Theory, Part 1. And in his classic book titled Christianity and Liberalism, by the way, if you don't have this book, I would recommend you you get it. It's by J. Gresham Machen. That last name is M-A-C-H-E-N. It's titled Christianity and Liberalism. Machen was a 20th century Presbyterian theologian. He uh, started out at Princeton Theological Seminary, and then as he saw Princeton going left, uh, he left Princeton and he founded uh, Westminster, Westminster Theological Seminary in, uh, in Philadelphia. But in his book, Christianity and Liberalism, Machen said this, quoting, Modern liberalism in the church, whatever judgment may be passed upon it, is at any rate no longer merely an academic matter. It is no longer a matter merely of theological seminaries or universities. On the contrary, its attack upon the fundamentals of the Christian faith is being carried on vigorously by Sunday school lesson helps, by the pulpit, and by the religious press. If such an attack be unjustified, the remedy is not to be found, as some devout persons have suggested, in the abolition of theological seminaries or the abandonment of scientific theology, but rather in a more earnest search after truth and a more loyal devotion to it when it is found, unquote. Now, you'll recall last night uh, my reiterating something to you that I'm personally very dogmatic about, and that is that every professing Christian must not only be a reader of the Bible, but a student of it, a student of it. Um, I'm going to say something here at the risk of maybe alienating some of you, but I don't mean to do that. Uh, But my wife, Melissa, knows that this is a a little bit of a point of contention for me. I think the degree to which many of us rely on devotionals is hurting us uh, in the church. 
Um, it's, it's in many ways it's serving as a crutch because the devotionals are in many cases looked at as having uh, the same uh, significance as Bible study time, as uh, uh, going to church and hearing an expository sermon read. I've got nothing against anyone who uh, happens to be a fan of devotionals. All I'm saying is don't let the devotional be your substitute for personal Bible study between you and the Holy Spirit and digging into the Word of God and understanding what these terms and verses mean so that you can become a better apologist yourself because your devotional won't do that for you. This is what we're getting at here with what Machen is talking about. When he talks about being engaged in a more earnest search after truth and a more loyal devotion to it when it is found, that's why we're all here. Now, I find Machen's words to be germane to the topic of critical race theory because the question many professing Christians are asking today is, what exactly is critical race theory anyway? What is it? What is it? Um, that's both a good and a necessary question to pose. It's a good question. You, meant, you re remember me yesterday mentioning, your, mentioning to you a term called narratology and how in the culture, narratology is just a way of using narrative and storytelling to get you to buy into a certain uh, agenda based on getting you emotionally involved and connected in it. Well, one trap of narratology is that a uh, you know, wokeists and critical race theorists will ask you uh, sort of condescendingly, well, you're, here you are criticizing critical race theory, but can you even define it? What is it? What is critical race theory? Do you even know what it is? Now, my advice to you is if you're ever asked that question by anyone, refuse to answer it. Because 99.9% .9 of the time, they don't know what critical race theory is either, which is why they're trying to put the onus on you. My motto is never do another person's homework for them. You let them go find out what it is. No, you don't answer that question. No, you tell me what critical race theory is, since you know, you know. So, but you have to be looking out for these traps, these sort of dialectical traps where they try to get you involved in these conversations. There is nothing wrong with not answering a question. Matter of fact, if you go through the Gospels, you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what you're going to find is more times than not when Jesus was asked a question, he never answered the question. He, he rarely, if ever, actually answered the question that was asked. And many times he would respond to that question with another question. And, and see, that's part of being a good apologist. You respond to questions with other questions. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what Machen is talking about here is really why all of us are here today. This is why all we, because we're in search for the truth. We know where the truth is. We just want to become more equipped. That's why I think this conference has a perfect name, the Equipping Conference. That's why we're here. So yes, it's a good question to ask. What is critical race theory? I gave you a one-sentence definition of that yesterday. But I believe professing Christians everywhere, regardless of denominational affiliation or po political persuasion, would do well to become better informed about what critical race theory is. Absolutely. You need to know what critical race theory is. You need to know what it looks like. We talked about that yesterday, how to identify it by its subtleties, by its camouflage, by its, by its stealthy terms. So yes, asking what critical race theory is, is an important question. And I'm going to address that again to some degree in this message. But first, I want to submit to you that the question, what is critical race theory, is really only a secondary matter. That's a secondary, secondary question. The primary and more important question we should be asking right now is the same question that Pontius Pilate posed in John 18, 38, when he asked, what is true? That's the question. That's the question. It is that question, what is truth, that is the most important question that any of us could ever ask. Parents, the reason you're trying to raise your children according to the scriptures, is because there's such a thing as truth. There's such a thing as truth. Bottom line, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are to be people of truth. We are to be people of truth because we are people of the truth. In John 17, 17, before he was arrested and subsequently crucified, Jesus petitioned his heavenly Father to sanctify them, and that pronoun, them, refers to all who believed in Christ then and all who will believe in him 
going forward in the future. Christ asked his father to sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Is truth. Your word is truth. In John 18, 37, Jesus said, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So by definition, Christians are people who, by God's sovereign grace, have heard the voice, in air quotes, of Jesus, not audibly, of course. I got Justin Peters back there. Justin, don't, don't, don't think I said that I said, stood up here and said people can hear the voice of Jesus audibly. I didn't say that. I'm just, just metaphorically. I don't, want to, I don't want to end up on one of Justin's videos, man. You, you, you don't want to do that. So no, but, but Christians are people who've heard the voice of God by means of having heard the truth of his word preached, that is the gospel, and consequently having had that truth made effectual under salva- salvation by virtue of the Spirit of God regenerating their sinful hearts and bringing them to faith in Jesus Christ. That's Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1.30 and Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It is that same truth that is the gospel that should serve as the compass or the north star, if you will, by which every professing believer in Christ should navigate this sinful world in which we live. A world which, according to 1 John 5, 19, lies in the power of the evil one. By the way, in that verse, the prepositional phrase, the world, in 1 John 5, 19, refers to the ungodly systems the practices, the mores, the principles by which this world functions and operates. And that includes every ideology, every philosophy, and yes, every theology that comes against God's word and against his church. And we're going to talk about this morning and then later on this afternoon when I give you part two of this message, you're going to understand how critical race theory itself is a theology. It's a theology. It's like I reiterated yesterday, critical race theory is not just an ideology, it's not an idea and some academic proposition that's being taught in schools. It's an entire worldview. Believers in Jesus Christ ought to have a gospel-oriented, meaning a truth-oriented, truth-saturated view of the world. And another way of saying that is that we are to have a biblical worldview about everything that encompasses the world in which we live. Everything. The early 20th century Dutch Reformed theologian Herman Bavink framed that idea in this way, quoting, truth is objective. It exists independently of us. It does not direct itself toward us. We must direct ourselves toward it. But just as the wisdom of God became flesh in Christ, so should the truth also enter us. In the path of freedom, it must become our personal and spiritual property. Through a living and true faith, it must become constitutive of our thinking and doing. Constitutive of our thinking and doing. Bavik said it must become, truth must become constitutive of our thinking and doing. And by asserting that the truth of the gospel be constitutive of our thinking and doing, Bavik is exhorting you and me to develop and to consistently apply a biblical worldview. For a Christian to possess and employ a biblical worldview is to filter everything about this world through the lens of what Scripture says about it. As the British theologian J.C. Ryle says in his classic book titled Holiness, quote, if a man does not realize the dangerous nature of his soul's disease, you cannot wonder if he is content with false and imperfect remedies. Among those false and imperfect remedies of which Ryle is speaking is, is critical race theory. <clears throat> critical race theory is a false and imperfect remedy for what ails our society. No, you won't find the term critical race theory in your Bible. Nevertheless, a primary reason that particular ideology has become such a point of division and contention within the evangelical church today is that many professing believers have failed to allow the gospel, as Herman Bavink said, they failed to allow the gospel to become constitutive of their thinking and doing, and especially of their thinking. 
is a failure which I would argue is largely, largely attributable to a collective ignorance in the evangelical church of what the Word of God has to say about such unbiblical philosophies. To put it another way, our churches are full of people who read God's Word but who actually don't study it. As the late Dr. R.C. Sproul said, everyone's a theologian. Do you see yourself that way? As a theologian? You you realize you don't have to be a seminary graduate to be a theologian. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a theologian. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a theologian right now as you sit there. John MacArthur says it this way. He says, if we're going to study the Bible... We've got to be committed to the fact that the Bible needs to be studied. In the book titled The Derrick Bell Reader, so named after the late Harvard University law professor Derrick A. Bell, who I mentioned yesterday is known as the father of critical race theory, Bell writes this, quoting, he says, critical race theory sprang up with the realization that the civil rights movement of the 1960s had stalled and needed new approaches to deal with the complex relationship among race, racism, and American law. Now, I mentioned to you yesterday, as I took you through the chronology of how we got to critical race theory, we went from the uh, uh, critical theory, the, the Frankfurt School, the uh, Institute of Social Research in Germany in the 1930s and then to the 1970s, uh, to the uh, critical legal studies movement, and then in the late 1980s, you get the critical race theory movement, all undergirded by cultural Marxism. But when Bell, what Bell is talking about here is, is something that I mentioned to you yesterday. We got to critical race theory because the critical race theorists didn't think that the critical legal studies movement had gone far enough. Now, when you look at the 1960s, especially in America, um, blacks gained significant victories um, uh, during that one decade. Uh, Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, Brown versus Board of Education, uh, blacks in America get, gain significant victories. And uh, if I can just take a detour here for one second, I, I think it's interesting when you look at the history of the uh, struggle for black civil rights in America, which re- really encompassed more than 100 years uh, to attain uh, the rights that we have now as blacks in America, as opposed to the rights that LGBTQ lobby has been able to gain in less than 10 What you'll find if you study the LGBTQ movement, they always hijack the black civil rights movement. It's like the black civil rights movement is the train with the engine and the LGBTQ movement comes on and attaches the caboose. The LGBTQ movement has gained in less than 10 years what it took black people in this country of more than 100 years. When you think about it. We go from the 1860s, coming out of the, the Civil War in 1865, you got Reconstruction, you got the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, you come out of that, then you've got the, uh, it, you start with the Emancipation Proclamation, you go with the uh, uh, Jim Crow laws that had to be defeated, then you had the uh, uh, redlining that had to be dealt with, and then you're into the 50s and 60s where you get into um, uh, education discrimination, housing discrimination, you get voting discrimination, things like that. You're looking at over 100 years to really get recognized as a person. But the LGBTQ, LGBTQ agenda, which is a minute, statistically speaking, a minute portion of the popula- population, look how much power they have. Less than 10 years, they're getting everything they want. So it's not people like me and Virgil that black people need to be angry at. They really should be angry at themselves for letting the LGBTQ lobby hijack the civil rights movement. That's what they should be angry at. In their book, Critical Race Theory and Introduction, co-authors Richard Delgado and Gene Stefancic define critical race, the, the, the critical race movement, critical race theory movement as, as follows, quoting, a collection of activists and scholars engaged in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. Critical race theory questions the very foundations of liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and neutral principles of constitutional law. 
After the first decade, critical race theory began to splinter and now includes a well-developed Asian American jurisprudence, a forceful Latino critical contingent, a feisty LGBTQ interest group, and now a Muslim and Arab caucus. Although the groups continue to maintain good relations under the umbrella of critical race theory, each has developed its own body of literature and set of priorities, unquote. So what you just heard is precisely why critical race theory is not only about race. It is entire worldview. It's a worldview that also promotes and advances an idea known in critical race theory circles as intersectionality. I mentioned that term yesterday, and it's founder Kimberly Crenshaw. What you heard me quote just now from Richard Delgado and G. Stefanski, that gives you an idea of how intersectional critical race theory is. It's not just about race. It's getting, it's getting all these different interest groups and ideologies involved toward the goal of, 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 of developing an entire worldview. And, and by the time I'm done here, you're going to understand why I titled this message the Marxist eschatology of critical race theory. Dr. Michael Dumas, assistant professor of African American studies at the University of California, Berkeley, describes Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality as follows, quote, intersectionality has been advanced within CRT as a way to capture the dynamic relationship between race and other quote unquote differences, including gender, sexuality, sexual identity, disability, and of course, social class, unquote. As a philosophical construct, critical race theory has its origins in one of the most demonic and destructive ideologies ever to exist in human history, namely Marxism. You'll recall me mentioning that yesterday. Marxism is responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of people. Yet you heard me quote from critical race theorists themselves yesterday that they credit Marxists for helping them develop that philosophy. Marxism, so-called because of its namesake, Karl Heinrich Marx, a German-Jewish-Argentine atheist and anti-Semite. Have you ever met or heard of a Jew who hates Jews? Well, that was Karl Marx. <coughs> Karl Marx was one of the most racist individuals ever to live. He hated everyone. He didn't care what your ethnic background was. He hated everyone. He was very influential in the formation of the critical legal studies movement of the 1970s, as you heard me say yesterday. According to the book titled The Handbook of Critical Race Theory and Education, Matter of fact, <clears throat> let me pause here and say, if you're going to get one book on critical race theory, get this book. The title is The Handbook of Critical Race Theory in Education, uh, first edition. The Handbook of Critical Race Theory in Education, first edition. If you want a sort of holistic view of what the agenda, motives, and inspirations that, that drive critical race theory are, it's in that book. I'm quoting from that book here. Composed predominantly of white neo-Marxist legal scholars and intellectuals who sought to expose and challenge the view that legal reasoning in America was neutral, values-free, and unaffected by social and economic relations, political forces, or cultural phenomena. For critical legal studies proponents, American law and legal institutions tend to serve to legitimize an oppressive social order." Unquote. So the critical legal studies movement operated under the presupposition that American jurisprudence was racist to put this in layman's terms. It was biased towards white people, biased against black people, people of color. Please note that the phrase oppressive social order is classic Marxist vernacular. You need to look out for certain buzzwords when you listen to these critical race theorists. Words like radical, words like trans transformation, words like oppressive, oppression, all those are Marxist terms. The use of those terms really should come as no surprise to any of us because in Marxism, everything is oppressive. Everything in Marxism is oppressive, but especially Christianity. Listen to what Karl Marx said in the Communist Manifesto, quoting him. The democratic concept of man is false because it is Christian. The democratic concept holds that each man is a sovereign being. This is the illusion, the dream, and the postulate of Christianity, unquote. It's interesting that in critical race theory, Christianity is the only faith-based worldview that's attacked. Critical race theorists don't go after Muslims, they don't go after Jews, they don't go after Buddhists, they don't go after any other religion other than Christianity. 
You know why? Because Marxism is so inherent to critical race theory, critical race theory has to operate in a way that it attacks Christianity because Christianity was the target of Marxism. This has all just come full circle. And given the influence of Marxism and critical legal studies movement, which subsequently influenced the critical race theory movement, I think it's both relevant and germane to our understanding of critical race theory to have some idea of the very significant role that Marxism played and continues to play in shaping the critical race theory worldview. And that understanding begins, I believe, with our gaining some insight into the kind of person that Karl Marx himself was. In his book titled A History of Western Philosophy and Theology, theologian John Frame, professor emeritus of systematic theology and philosophy at Reformed Theological Seminary, writes this, quote, Marx was an admirer of Charles Darwin. Marx believed that the ultimate causes of events were material, not mental. Further, in his view, those ultimate causes were economic, were economic. The attempts of people to achieve material well-being are what motivate the events of history. In his analysis of the production of goods, Marx distinguished between factors of production, that is food, clothing, shelter, work skills, and relations of production, master, slave, owner, worker, etc. It was the relations of production Marx thought to be the more important in understanding historical, historical change. So in his understanding, all past history has been determined by class conflict. Where do you remember that from? We broke that down yesterday. But how everything in Marxism, just like critical race theory, is class antagonism, is class conflict. There is always an upper class and a lower class. There are always haves and have-nots. In ancient times, the haves were the slave owners and the have-nots the slaves. The interests of these two groups were entirely opposed. Any increase in the prosperity of the owner is at the expense of the slave and vice versa. Now you'll recall what I'm reading here from John Frame and talking about Karl Marx, the term in critical race theory for that is interest convergence. So what you're hearing Frame articulate about uh, the worldview of Karl Marx in that any increase in the prosperity of the owner is at the expense of the slave and interest conversion, any increase in the station of life of a white person is always at the expense of a black person. Marxism and critical race theory are like this. Just like this. It's a zero-sum relationship. So conflict is an unavoidable consequence. I'm still quoting John Frame. Christians were in the vanguard in abolishing the slave trade and slavery itself, also in the care of orphans and widows, improving education, encouraging science and art. But Marx thought that religions and liberal social movements should not be encouraged. In his view, they were counterproductive because they are they 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 were counterproductive because they were there was precious time and energy wasted, and that energy that time and energy does not get to the root of the real problem. The real problem he and later Marxists argued, are structural. Now, where do you hear that? You hear that all the time in critical race theory. We must tear down the structures. We must, tear the, we must destroy these structures. We must destroy these institutions. Continuing to quote John Frame, they cannot be solved until there is a radical change in the very nature of society. They cannot be solved until there's a radical change in the nature, very nature of society. The means of production must be taken away from the rich capitalists and given to the representatives of the poor. Representatives of the poor. Let me give you a contemporary real-time example of how that's working out right now. It's working out right now through Black Lives Matter. The representatives of the poor in this case are Patrice Colors, Opal Tometi, and April Garza, the three co-founders of Black Lives Matter who have been enriching themselves to the, to the degree of tens of millions of dollars, while the black people who, who many people thought black lives existed to help continue to languish in poverty. This is exactly what's happening right now with Black Lives Matter. Representatives of the poor. It's always the representatives of the poor that get wealthy. It's never the poor who get help. That money never gets down to the poor. 
Never. The representatives of the poor. So Marx, still quoting Frame, so Marx described religion, particularly Christianity, as an opiate, a kind of drug given to the poor by the rich to persuade them that revolution is not needed. Under the influence of the opiate, they come to think that they will get their due reward through normal social change and eventually a reward in the sky by and by. So Marxists regard religion, especially Christianity, as a barrier to revolution and, that, and therefore a barrier to truly radical social change, unquote. Again, that quote was from John Frame's book, A History of Western Philosophy and Theology. Again, the phrase radical social change is merely code for Marxism. Wherever you see that word radical, it's either Marxist or communist that they're talking about. Cultural Marxism is that brand of Marxism that fuels the critical race theory movement today. We talked about that yesterday, about how Antonio Gramsci is the father of cultural Marxism. In an article for, speaking of Gramsci, in an article for the Foundation for Economic Education, or FEE, FEE, titled Antonio Gramsci, The Godfather of Cultural Marxism, author Bradley Thomas writes this, quote, there's little debate that modern day American universities, public education, mainstream media, Hollywood, and political advocacy groups are dominated by leftists. This is no accident, but part of a deliberate strategy to pave the way for communist revolution developed more than eight decades ago by an Italian political theorist named Antonio Gramsci. Described as one of the world's most important and influential Marxist theorists since Marx himself, if you are not familiar with Gramsci, you should be. Gramsci wrote in the 1930s of a, quote, war of position, unquote, for socialists and communists to subvert Western culture from the inside. The Italian communist, who lived from 1891 to 1937, is credited with the blueprint that has served as the foundation for the cultural Marxist movement in modern America. In his view, a new collective will is required to advance this war of position for the revolution. To him, that is to Gramsci, it is vital to evaluate what can stand in the way of his will, i.e. certain influential social groups with the prevailing capitalist ide ideologies that could impede this progress. Let me pause right here. One of those influential social groups that Gramsci is talking about here that could stand in the way or could impede the progress of this revolution moving forward is the church. In other words, you. This is exactly why critical race theory is coming after your schools, it's coming after your church, and it's coming after the place where you work. It's coming. It's coming. Continuing the quote from Bradley Thomas's article, Gramsci spoke of organizations including churches, charities, the media, schools, universities, and quote, economic corporate, unquote, power as organizations that needed to be invaded by socialist thinkers. Now, you, you might understand how secular entities like universities, the media, corporate interests might be subject and more, I guess, more apt to fall for this kind of stuff. But it's churches that are buying into this stuff as well. Churches and denominations. Churches and denominations that are being invaded by socialist thinkers. And it's not even an invasion anymore. You've got evangelical seminaries that exist as I stand here right now that are teaching critical race theory that are advocating, advocating liberation theology. Listen to our next episode, I'm gonna name names. But when 
Bradley Thomas writes of Antonio Gramsci, saying that these institutions need to be invaded from the inside by socialist thinkers. It's happening. It's happening. It's, but it's like I said yesterday, don't think that your place of work is going to say, yeah, we're introducing this new Marxist program for HR. <laughs> They're not going to say that. They're going to add, you're going to get an email asking you to fill out a survey from a consulting firm that helps develop diversity, equity, inclusion programs. That's going to be the Marxist invasion of your place of business through DEI. It's going to come into your school as ethnic studies, social and emotional learning, SEL. That's how it's coming in. That's how this invasion that Gramsci talks about is going to happen. It's happening right now. On August 17th of 2020, the website for Catholic World Report published a review of a Zen new book, and I quoted from this book yesterday. It was a book by Dr. Paul Kengor titled The Devil and Karl Marx. Catholic World Report published a review of that book back in August of 2020. And the following is an excerpt from that review. Quote, in the chapter titled, My Soul is Chosen for Hell, Kingor provides excerpts from the demonic poetry and pose, prose of Karl Marx, written several years before his Communist Manifesto in 1848, in which he waxed poetic about, quote, the hellish vapors that rise and fill the brain till I go mad and my heart is utterly changed. See this sword? The prince of darkness sold it to me. For me, he beats the time and gives the signs. Ever more boldly, I play the dance of death, unquote. Remarking on that poem entitled The Player, Dr. Kengor notes, quote, the blood violinist is not destroying the world because he hates it, but is doing so in order to spite God out of derision and mockery against the creator. He is a rebel like Satan the ultimate rebel against God and heaven, unquote. Marxism does the same by destroying the world as it exists, creating a new world in which God is destroyed and man is elevated, unquote. If you don't have the book, The Devil and Karl Marx by Dr. Paul Kingor, I encourage you to get it and read it. See, see it's dangerous to listen to me and Virgil. It's, it's just dangerous because you're going to go broke listening listen, listen to us. The, the, the books and the white papers and stuff that you hear us citing in our podcast episode, this is stuff we've read. These books are in my library right now. I've read them all. This is why I can recommend them to you because I've read them. So I'm not trying to get you to go out, of, especially what, what gas here is almost $5, uh, more than $5 in some cases. I'm not trying to get you guys to spend. I know stuff is expensive right now. But really, if you want to be equipped, if you really want to be equipped, you have to invest. You have to invest in, 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 in expanding your library. So uh, consider getting a copy of the book, The Devil and Karl Marx by Dr. Paul Kingor. That last name is K-E-N-G-O-R. But what I want you to catch at the last part of that quote from that Catholic World Report review of Dr. Kingor's book is where Dr. Kingor says, Marxism does the same by destroying the world as it exists, creating a new world in which God is destroyed and man is elevated. Now those four words, creating a new world, is not only the goal of Marxism, but it's also the goal of critical race theory. Creating a new world, that's eschatological language. That's eschatological language. See, what you have to understand about eschatology um, too often within the church, you hear that word eschatology, and it too often refers to something coming to an end. But eschatology isn't only about something coming to an end. It's about something coming to an end and something else beginning. So it's not just the end. It's the end and then starting something else. That vision is reflected by Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanczyk in their book, which I cited earlier, Critical Race Theory and Introduction, where they say this, quote, Although CRT began as a movement in law, 
it has rapidly spread beyond that discipline. Today, many scholars in the field of education consider themselves critical race theorists who use CRT's ideas to understand issues of school discipline and hierarchy, tracking, affirmative action, high stakes testing, controversies over curriculum and history, bilingual and multicultural education, and alternative and charter schools. And let me pause in this quote right here. What you are hearing Delgado and Stefancic articulate is exactly why in public schools, especially as it relates to black children, the bar, the academic bar is not only being lowered, it's being eliminated. SATs are no longer necessary. ACTs, you don't have to have that. LSATs, you don't have to have LSATs to even get into law school anymore. I was just reading just, just last week, um, somewhere in California, uh, in a public school system out there somewhere, uh, teachers are now uh, being required to factor in the child's ethnicity in, in grading them. Where they're automatically imparting to that child, if it's a black child, if it's, a, if it's an ethnic minority, especially a black child, a victimhood mentality whereby they're already assuming that that child is incapable of learning, so we have to offset, offset that by factoring that into the grades that we give them. So what's problematic about that, uh, many things that are problematic about that, but one of, one of which is when they come, uh, when those young children who are now seven, eight years old, when they get to be 17 and 18, and they're gonna be graduated from high school totally illiterate. They won't know how to read, they won't know how to add, but they're gonna be graduated out of high school. They're gonna be pushed out into society, incapable of fending for themselves because of critical race theory. See, what, what, I'm gonna read this section again because I want you to get what they're saying here. Although CRT began as a movement in the law, it has rapidly spread beyond that discipline. Today, many scholars in the field of education, that's why you need to get that book I referenced earlier, Critical Race Theory in Education. That's where it starts, it's in the schools. The schools are the entry port, then it goes from the schools into the homes, and then to the homes into society. Many scholars in the field of education consider themselves critical race theorists who use CRT's ideas to understand issues of school discipline. Again, black children aren't disciplined anymore. Matter of fact, what I recall about that article, uh, V, you may be familiar with this as well, of what's going on in California, along with that, the teachers cannot even report black children who are disruptive in class, who even make threats. You can't report them to, to the officials anymore. That, that's this. That's the result of this right here. Discipline is racist. Having them take a test is racist. So when Delgado and Stefanski say, well, CRT helps us understand issues? No. No. What did I say yesterday? Critical race theory fundamentally is looking at the entire world and finding something to criticize about it. That's this right here. Issues of school discipline and hierarchy, tracking, affirmative action, high stakes testing. What's high stakes testing? You mean testing that prepares them to live out in the world? That high state testing? <laughs> testing that makes sure they can fill out a job application? Listen, I'm director of social media at Grace to You, so I'll, I'm a tech guy. But what's killing this generation right now is what's killing subsequent generations is that you can apply for a job by just holding up your phone. You realize that emojis is a language now. Emojis is a language. Children don't know how to write. They don't know how to form a sentence. Because I, all I have to do is, is text a shortcut on my phone. V, I think it was the conference we were at up in Minnesota earlier this year, and uh, I think it was February, and. Uh, the green room that they had set up for us was a classroom on the church campus. 
And I remember walking in there, I'm just kind of looking around, getting the lay of the place, and I see a behind me to my left, a chalkboard up on the wall with actual penmanship letters. You guys remember those? You know what penmanship is? <laughs> I'm like, man, look at that. We, we, we are pushing our children out of school who can't write a sentence. They can't. They cannot form a cognitive sentence because everything's done through this little box. This is what critical race theory is doing. High stakes testing. Controversies over curriculum and history. Well, see, what that means is, well, you guys are teaching too much white European Western history in your classroom. You need more W.E.B. Du Bois. You need more Malcolm X. You need more Louis Farrakhan. That's what you need. So you have, to, you have to learn to read between these words and these terms to see what these folks are really saying. History, bilingual and multicultural education, and alternative charter schools. That's next. Matter of fact, those of you who homeschool, don't think you're out of the woods. You're next. The Biden administration has already announced tighter regulations for charter schools. Why? Because they're married to the teachers' unions. They want to make it as hard as possible for you to, to, have to, to educate your children outside of the public schools. They're going to make it absolutely as hard as possible for you to homeschool your children. So don't think you're out of the woods. This is coming for you, too. This is coming. Please don't be naive about this. Continuing to quote Delgado and Stefanski, political scientists ponder voting strategies coined by critical race theorists while women's studies professors teach about intersectionality. Ethnic studies, see, they're saying the quiet part out loud. They're telling you what their goal is. Ethnic studies courses often include a unit on critical race theory, and American studies departments teach material on critical white studies developed by critical race theory writers. Sociologists, theologians, and healthcare specialists use critical race theory and its ideas. See, I have to pause here again. This is why I love working with Virgil. Because I was telling Jim here just a second ago, see, what Virgil and I do, we're, we're really myth busters is what we are. We're, we're, we're myth busters. We get, to come to, we get to come to conferences like this and just bust myths. We bust narratives. I'm reading to you directly from a critical race theory resource. They are telling you in their own words what their goal is. I don't have to give you my opinion. Virgil doesn't have to give you his opinion. We cite original sources and tell you from their own mouths. We've read these books. Philosophers incorporate critical race ideas in analyzing issues such as viewpoint discrimination and whether Western philosophy is inherently white in its orientation, values, and method of reasoning. See, you guys are the enemies. I told you this yesterday. If you're white, you, you're done. You're the target of critical race theorists, white people. When they say things like Western philosophy, translate white people. <laughs> Unlike some academic disciplines, critical race theory contains an activist dimension. Don't forget that. Critical race theory contains an activist dimension. It tries not only to understand our social situation, but to change it. That's a more eschatological language right there. Setting out not only to ascertain how society organizes itself along racial lines and hierarchies, but to transform them. That's why this message is titled The Marxist Eschatology of Critical Race Theory. They want to change the world. They want to destroy, as Dr. Paul Kingo wrote, and I quoted him yesterday, they want to destroy the Western Judeo-Christian foundation of this country and replace it with a Marxist utopia. And I told you this yesterday, they want to invert the hierarchy. You're hearing it in their own words.
that critical race theorists seek to change and transform Western society, again, is what makes that ideology eschatological. Delgado and Stefanski acknowledge in their own words, quote, critical race theory contains an activist dimension, unquote, toward that very end, toward that very eschatological end. But they're not the only ones. Self-described trans-queer activist, Latin, Latinx scholar, and public theologian, Robin Henderson Espinoza, shares that eschatological vision as well. In her book titled Activist Theology, she writes this, quote, Activist theology is no, now, let me pause here. You're about to hear some of the most unintelligible gibberish that you've ever heard. But this is what critical race theorists do. The more of their materials that you read, the more you're going to find that these are doctoral, postdoctoral, some of them, and their books are written for their peers. They're written for one another. So what they do is they thrive on integrating multisyllabic terms and creating new multisyllabic terms that no one but them knows what they mean. But they write to impress one another is what they do. So don't blame me if you don't understand what I'm about to say. <laughs> Quote, this, this is not me. This is Robin Henderson Espinoza. You may be familiar with the name if you've listened to our episode titled Activist Theology. We quote from this book. Robin Henderson Espinoza says this. Again, don't blame me, but this is what she says. I am quoting, Activist theology is normative in this sense because it enfleshes an eschatological horizon, one that is always about collective liberation. When we lean into rupture, and likewise into the political subjectivity of becoming, we see the possibility of radical social change emerge in the entanglement of protest and revolution. Radical social change materializes with a commitment to militant peace in the practice of bridging radical differences, creating threshold spaces that another world is possible, so that another world is possible. More eschatological language right there. While militant peace is embodied in the discipline of dismantling systems of oppression, militancy is productive because it demands a deep commitment to midwifing shalom in the world in order for the beloved kingdom to materialize." Unquote. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it took everything within me not to burst out laughing while I'm Midwifing shalom, what the? <laughs> Militant peace. But this is what they do. They write gibberish like this in their books to impress one another. But see, again, I'm, listen, I'm not bragging on verbs. I'm not like putting us up on a pedal or something like that. But this is how we get down. This is why it takes us so long to prepare for an episode of Just Think a Podcast, because we're reading stuff like this. <laughs> it it take, took me one week. Wait, wait, midwife and shalom. I'm, 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 I'm spending a whole week just trying to understand what those two words are saying. <laughs> but seriously, that's what they do. When, when you read these books that I'm referring you to that are written by critical race theorists, they're extremely... Highly academic, but that's by design. They're not written for the layperson. They're written to the people who are going to be the soldiers in their critical race theory military that's going to be executing these, this agenda at the ground level. They're not written for you and me. But don't worry, Virgil and me, we got you covered. We're, we're, we're reading this stuff. In biblical theology, eschatology, taken from the Greek noun eschaton, is a study of what the Bible has to say about the end times. More specifically, biblical eschatology has to do with God destroying this present world and replacing it with an altogether new one. I would venture to say, however, that the overwhelming majority of Christians, when they think about eschatology to whatever degree they do think about it and what it entails, they tend to think about it apocalyptically. And consequently, they immediately turn to the book of Revelation to have their curiosity assuaged. Indeed, the book of Revelation does have much to say concerning how this present world is destined to end, but not all eschatological language is found in the book of Revelation. 
In fact, one of my most reassuring eschatological verses of Scripture is found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. In the New American Standard Translation, that passage reads this way. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Let me pause here. This, this verse is, is a one verse apologetic against Christian nihilism. We are not nihilists. Okay, we're, we're, we're not like the critical race theorists and the Marxists who think you're just here in this world trying to make your way through and then after you die, there's nothing. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? And here's the really encouraging part, verse 13 of 2 Peter 3. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. See, the critical race theorist thinks you can create that here. The words of 2 Peter 3.13 serve as an excellent example of the distinction between biblical eschatology and the temporal eschatology that is proffered within critical race theory. Biblical eschatology teaches that the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men, the 2 Peter 3.7, and that there will one day be a completely new heaven and a completely new earth, which God himself will bring to reality. That's Revelation 21.1. Now you contrast that with the man-centered eschatology of critical race theory, which proffers the idea that humanity innately possesses the ability and capacity to bring about a new world in the here and now. Not physically, of course, but societally and culturally. This view was expressed by Ibram X. Kendi, Founder, founding director of the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research. Matter of fact, Jamar Tisby is part of that organization now. Ibram X. Kendi said this in an interview in 20, 2021. You can find this interview on YouTube. He was at a church, in, a liberal church in New York, and he was being interviewed at that church, and he said this in response to a question that he was asked. I'm quoting Ibram X. Kendi. Jesus was a revolutionary. And the job of the Christian is to revolutionize society. The job of the Christian is to liberate society from the powers on earth that are oppressing humanity, unquote. The powers on earth that are, that are oppressing humanity is white people. That's how you can translate that. Needless to say, the theology of Ibram X. Kennedy is proffering, the theology that he's proffering is not the biblical gospel. The job of the Christian is not to liberate society from the powers on earth that are oppressing humanity. That's not our job. As I said yesterday, Christ came to save sinners. He did not come to save society. I have more to say on this in part two later this afternoon. Thank you very much. Got a 10-minute break coming up. All right, see you guys in 10 minutes.